a big problem this morning. All right, it's just 10 o'clock now. Like I said, we just have so much to get through that I am going to go ahead and get started. But hopefully anybody who comes in the next few minutes won't feel like they missed too much. I think pretty much everyone in the chat knows me, but just in case, I'm Veronica Reynolds. I'm the head of community relations at New City Library. And you may be asking um, why I'm giving this lecture today instead of one of our great hired presenters, which is a great question. This is actually one of my great passions. Um, I, in undergrad, took Old English, Chaucer, Shakespeare, <laughs> And I took a wonderful class called the History of the English Language, and I liked it so much that I then went forward and TA'd that class, so I took it twice, essentially. Um, I'm fascinated by the evolution of English. It is a older language than we suspect, and its roots are complicated. So let's get underway. So the dawn of English, the English language, really begins all the way back in 5000 BCE with Indo-European. So Indo-European is the root language for many modern languages. It's considered a proto-language or language family. Modern Lithuanian is the closest um, to what we believe the original sounded like. With many of these old languages, we only have a vague idea of how they might have sounded, but that's a good guess. Excuse me, and around 1000 BCE, we get the spread of Indo-European. So I'm gonna try and share some videos with you today. So it'll just take me a minute to switch between those screens. So this is a, this is a lovely video um, put together. And Okay, so I see in the chat that you can't hear me when I have the video sound on. That's fine. I will refrain from talking over the videos in that case. Um, this is the only one that doesn't have any speaking over it. But just to give you the full picture here, you can see that we started in Turkey and we've now spread out all the way through Europe. And we're going to switch back over to our slides here. Okay. I lost you guys. Hold on one second. Let me get my chat back here. I don't want to lose your chat. Okay. So I won't talk over the videos. I apologize for that. I didn't realize you wouldn't be able to hear me. All right. Um, it's important you hear the video sound later because we're going to have some examples of how different parts of English sounded. So we saw that spread. You can see the splits in the language family are Hellenic and Italic, all of these large language families that are really critical to the evolution of languages across Europe. There are some hints of where that first split exists. So there are these words that sound kind of similar throughout language families. If you've ever learned another language, particularly a romance language, you may have noticed that some of these words become semi-shared. So here's some examples that we have. So we say father, vater in German, pater in Latin and Greek, fader in Old Norse, and pither in the ancient Vedic Sanskrit. Brother as well, in English, Bruer in Dutch, Bruder in German, Brather in, Ga in Gaelic, and Brother in Norse, and Brather in Sanskrit. So it gives you an idea. Some base language words, I think particularly family words, um, counting, kind of these basic concept words do seem to not evolve too far. So the apple doesn't roll too far from the language tree, so to speak. So these broad language groups will in turn be divided over time into lots and lots of new languages from Swedish to Portuguese to Hindi to Latin. Um, 
So it is astounding but true that languages as diverse as Gaelic and Greek, Farsi and Singhalese, all had a common root language. Just a word for people who are coming in now, if you have any questions at any time or comments, you can go ahead and put them in chat. I have the chat up as well, so I can see exactly um, what you need. So we become interested in Germanic around 1000 BCE, uh, Germanic or Proto-Germanic. It can be traced all the way back to the region between the Elbe River in modern Germany and, Sweet and Southern Sweden. Over time, certain consonants in Germanic family language have shifted from the Indo-European base. So you get Germanic words like the English foot is the West Frisian fuet. Why Frisian in particular? Well, you'll hear Frisian mentioned a few times. Frisian is the language that is closest to modern English. And it is still spoken, but by like less than a thousand people. It's a very, it's a very small country, Frisia, and they mostly speak English, I believe, and German. Um, but you get the West Frisian foot, Danish fud, Swedish fut. They're all related to the Latin head and the Lithuanian peda, Sanskrit pada. So due to the shift, shifting of the P to the F and the D to the T, the Germanic consonants kind of migrate away. And then Germanic slowly split into even further groups. So North Germanic becomes Old Norse. That's what a lot of um, our modern Norse topic uh, stories come from. So if you've ever heard of, a, um, of Thor and Loki, those would have been written in Old Norse. And then you get your various Scandinavian languages, Eastern Germanic, which was spoken by people who migrated to the Eastern and Southeastern parts of Europe, and whose three component language branches were Burgadian, Vandalic, and Gothic, but they all die out over time. Uh, the first person to really start rooting through these German languages and noticing their consistency as a scholar was actually Jacob Grimm of Grimm's Fairy Tales, um, which would have happened. They were helped, the Grimm's, one of the Grimm's aims in collecting all of those Ger Grimm fairy tales was to unify Germany. Germany still had many dialects at that time and was split into many small countries, and they were trying to create a unified set of folklore to feel like the country was one. Uh, and Gothic, by the way, was a language that was spoken through most of Eastern, Central, and Western Europe as, um, early into the first millennia. So Gothic was very popular, um, and it's probably one of the reasons we call things Gothic architecture. But to have English, we have to have England. But there was a life in England before English, before it was called England. Remember I told you we had to pay attention to that Gaelic label on that map? Well, that's because of our Celts and Britons. The name Celtic comes from Keltoi, meaning barbarian, uh, which as you know, means anyone who's not us. So they were othered by the Greek and Romans. Prior to about 800 BCE, we don't really know a lot of what was going on in England. There wasn't a lot of written history that survived in any case. Um, and the Celts weren't just in England, but they were through a lot of it, Europe, but they were slowly pushed back. Um, and despite their dominance, we don't actually have a lot of Celtic inspired words in English. Um, and mostly they are words about places. You will see this again when we talk about American words being borrowed from Native Americans. It usually has to do with physical places or animals, things that when the first people arrived in a land, excuse me, they might have said to the Native population, well, what do you call that? Um, so some Celtic words that we do have are umbe, which is a word for valley, Crag, which you might have heard of, and Tor, which if you're a new city person, might sound fairly familiar because of course we have Little Tor and High Tor. So then we arrive at the Romans. They first come to Britain in 55 BCE under Julius Caesar. They set up a permanent occupation. It has a huge impact on culture, religion, geography, architecture, and the social behavior of Britain. And certainly it drove back a lot of the native Celts. So it didn't have a huge impact on language. The Romans spoke Latin and they were not super interested in intermingling that language with what was going on around them. And the Celts were their enemies. They weren't thrilled with this invasion. They didn't wanna really adopt their words. 
So we only get a few loan words into English at that time. Loan words are words that we take from other languages. Loan is kind of a funny way of saying it because we don't exactly give them back, um, but they were mostly related to money. Then we get to the birth of Old English at last. The invasion of Germanic tribes makes a huge impression on the land of England. Around 430 CE, the Celtic warlord Vortigern invited the Jute brothers Hengest and Horsa to settle on the east coast of Britain to help defend against sea raids by the Picts, a kind of Celtic tribe. They were from um, Jutland, which is modern day Denmark, um, and they were from an uh, region, so then, I'm sorry, so you get the sea raids with the Picts against the Jute brothers, who were essentially Danish, and the Angles gradually began to settle in. This is a different tribe, and the Angles are from a spur of land that connects modern in, um, Denmark with Germany, and it's called Angola. The Frisian people also begin to encroach on the British mainland. They all spoke variations of a Western tongue and a Western Germanic tongue, which again is very similar to Frisian. All right, any questions yet? <laughs> England, English hasn't even been born. We're move, I promise we will move it as fast as I can through all this, it's quite a bit. Um, right, so the Celts fought against the invasion of these tribes, just like they fought against the Romans, but they were slowly pushed back into what is now Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, and Ireland, where they get pushed out, which is again, another reason we don't have a lot of surviving Celtic words in English. The Germanic tribes settled in seven smaller kingdoms now known as the Heptarchy. The Saxons in Essex, Wessex, and Sussex, the Angles in East Anglica, Mercia, and North Umbria, and the Jutes in Kent. Linguistic evidence of their settling is found in place names. So again, place names are like the number one thing that we borrow from other languages because it's just easier to keep calling someplace what it is. So a lot of these um, suffixes are gonna be things that we still use. You probably know towns in America that end with all of these words. So ing meaning people of, worthing, reading, hastings. Ton means an enclosure or a village. Taunton, Burton, Roten. Ford means a river crossing. Ashford, Bradford, and Watford. Ham means farm. Nottingham, Burningham, Grantham. Stead means a site, Hampstead. You may notice these are all towns in England that you've probably heard of before. These names have lingered since all the way back to the invasion of the Germanic tribes. They stayed. In fact, you may notice that Essex, Wessex, and Sussex are all still places in England. They kept these names. Various kingdoms kind of came in and out of power while this was happening, but it was ultimately the warlike and pagan Saxons that become the dominant group. Meanwhile, the Celtic languages only survive today in Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. Um, the Britain language of Brittany had its last native speaker, oh, I'm sorry, the last native speaker of the Cornish language, which was in Cornwall, died in 1777. And the last native speaker of Manx, which is a Celtic language spoken only on the Isle of Man, died as recently as the 1960s. And these are considered dead languages. The only reason you may have ever heard of Manx is you may have seen a tailless cat known as the Manx cat, which is native to that island. So the Anglo-Saxons. So again, you get the dominant Saxon tribe, but the Angles were doing fairly well too. So sometimes you will hear Old English referred to as the Anglo-Saxon language. Once Albion and then Britannia under the Romans became known as Angoland or Ingolaland, um, that was eventually shortened to England for obvious reasons. By 600 CE, English had become a very distinct language that was separate instead of from German dialects. And then over time, you get four major dialects. There's more than that, but those are the four major ones of Old English. Northumbrian in the north of England, Mercian in the Midlands, West Saxon in the south and west, and Kentish in the southeast. This continues, by the way, there are many dialects of English for a long time. Travel was really long. People wound up staying where they were. They, the, the dialects would diverge and people would meet up and they'd probably be able to understand each other to a certain extent. And this, by the way, impacts modern English culture. If you ever talk to an English person, you know their accents vary 
very much from place to place. And a lot of that is because of these early dialects. So the Celts and the early Saxons were using an alphabet of runes if they were writing instead of um, Latin alphabet. They were angular characters that were developed specifically to be scratched into wood or stone. So you didn't want any curves because you were trying to do a this action um, to carve into things. So we do have remaining um, written language as far back as 450, 480 CE. And the first known English sentence reads, this she-wolf is a reward to my kinsmen. And it was a runic inscription on a gold medallion found in Suffolk. This is what runes would look like. You can see they're very sharp and angular, all things that would be easy to carve into rock or stone. Um, what you see depicted there on the right is the Frank's casket, which is an Anglo-Saxon box. It's made of whalebone. It's from the first half of the eighth century CE. And um, the story being told there is Wyland the Smith and the Adoration of the Magi. This piece is currently in the British Museum. And it's a lovely remaining example of runes. One of the few I think are actually in rock or wood. And hence it's survival. Christianity and literacy. So these are two big topics, right? When we're talking about language, it seems to go hand in hand with writing. That's why we're talking about the runes. Um, but literacy was probably relatively low. The St. Augustine and his 40 missionaries from Rome bring Christianity to the pagan Anglo-Saxons and the rest of England in 597 CE. Um, there were some practicing Christians in England before this, whether they were left over um, from other mission trips or people who had traveled there for one reason or another. It just hadn't really taken off. This is like the big um, match point of Christianity taking off in England. And because of this, the Anglo-Saxons adopted the new Roman alphabet. They had to be able to communicate back and forth, but they did take some of their runes with them. So we get the Thwin, the Thorn, the F, and the Yog. Um, but Latin itself, even though it was a dominant language of Christianity, did not have a large impact on the English language at the time. Um, because it was restricted to the name, they kind of kept just the, um, the words they would have had to know, which is how to refer to people in power, right? So you get priest and vicar, and then some things that were so particular to Christianity that they just didn't have words for them previously, altar, mass, church, baptism, things of that nature. So those are the words that came over at that time. Now it's where we start to get a lot more written examples of the language. But before I continue, I wanna make sure there's no, if there are questions, like I said, at any time, please put them in chat. Um, you know, if you're confused about something or you need some clarity on something, please let me know. You're about to watch another video so you can get a break from, from this. So the earliest recorded work in English is called Cadman's Hymn. And I wanna go ahead and give you a taste of that. Oh, I do have a question in that. I sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't have the Q&A up. Um, Michelle asks, English is not my first language, but at least to say I'm now fluent in it. While I still struggle with spelling is with spelling in English, why do we not spell and write English as it sounds? Thank God for spell check. Okay, I actually have a whole piece on that. If you can stick with me, um, we I am gonna tell you exactly why spelling is so messed up in English. And the reasons are many and you are not alone. Um, English is quite hard to learn how to spell for a very good reason. Um, why were there so many German tribes? Well, German, Germany as a country didn't exist. Um, in fact, a lot of modern day Europe countries um, didn't exist. Um, why were they going to England in particular? That's a great question. Um, England had a lot of great natural resources. Germany was very crowded with these warring tribes. And it was really easy to get to England. You had to cross a very narrow band of water, so your boats didn't have to be particularly large. Um, the Celtic people, while warlike, were spread out quite a bit. So you could get a really good foothold on the coast and then just push inland once you had enough of your army there. Um, so England was actually a prime raid spot for a long time. Um, there was a lot going on there, and they had brisk trade with Europe on and off. So you could intercede on those ships to steal some stuff. Um, it was actually a pretty good place to raid and word would get out. So you would get one um, tribe would go and maybe their cousin had left to join another tribe and he'd say, hey, 
you know, pickings are really good in England, come on over. Uh, it helped that the Romans had occupied and kind of been left, so they had pushed back the native people to some extent um, and kind of left a lot of room for invasion. I hope that answers that question. Okay, so I am gonna leave the Q&A up as well. I'm sorry, I don't wanna miss that again. I will leave that over here for myself as well. Okay, um, right, so the earliest recorded work that in English that we have is called Cadman's Hymn. So I do have a recording of that that I'd love to share for you and I won't try and talk over it this time or in my lesson there. Nu shulan hirian heaven reaches weird, meo to this meakta and his mod ye thank, where quolder father swa he wundre ye was, eche drichten, or on stelde, he eres shelp erten barnum, helfen to grove, hali sheep and thamidan yerd, man kinis weird, eche drichten, after teode, firam folden, freya. So you can see it's not particularly long. I've got to stop getting stop shared. Hold on. Sorry. Okay. Oh, Jill had a follow up question. She said she was surprised there was so much room in England. I don't think the country was that big. Um, it's not huge, but this would remember be prior to modern civilization being built up on top of it. It was very good farmland. It was very forested at the time in a way it's not now. Um, when I went to Ireland, they talked about this. Ireland used to be entirely forested and now it has almost no natural forests. Um, they would have needed less land. They would have been looking for fertile farmland in particular, which England did have. So what you just heard was Cadman's hymn and I'm gonna read you the translation. Now we must honor the guardian of heaven, the might architect and his purpose, the work of the father of glory as he, the eternal Lord, established the beginning of wonders. He first created for the children of men, heaven as a roof, the holy creator. Then the guardian of mankind, the eternal Lord, Lord afterwards appointed the middle earth, the lands for men, the Lord almighty. Cadman's hymn has an interesting story around it because it tells us a lot about how things were working at the time. So monasteries, believe it or not, used to be co-ed. You had nuns and monks sharing the same facility and they had parties at night. They played music, they drank. Um, the prohibitions were different at the time. Um, but Cadman was so pious that when the hand lute was passed to him, he didn't feel it was right to play music and have a party in the house of the Lord. So he retreated to the barn and wrote down this very first recorded English hymn. Now, the reason that we know that that happened, to some extent, could be biased, is we have St. Bede the Venerable. Uh, Bede came along in 673 CE. He lived until 735 CE. And he was responsible for preserving Cadman's work, as well as a lot of other early English, excuse me, a lot of early English works. He wrote a book called The Ecclesi Ecclesiastical History of the English People. It was written in Latin, but it had many traces of Anglo-Saxon culture and history, including preserving Cadman's hymn in the original Old English. This I wanted to share with you to see there's something in italics here, because when we talk about what do we learn from things like the ecclesial, ecclesiastical history of the English people, well, Anglo-Saxon culture was really different from modern culture. They were built around mead halls where you would have a lord. And often this meant they went raiding. They would go out and they would raid other tribes. They would journey to other countries to perform these raids and they would bring back treasure. So sometimes they were called treasure, hoard, treasure halls. Um, and your mead lord or your treasure lord would distribute that to your people. And sometimes, very often, this mead hall was the largest place in your village and you might sleep there because it had the biggest fire in the winter. Your whole life would circulate around this Lord and this building. They weren't really kings, though some of them became elevated to that position, as we'll talk about briefly with Beowulf, but they were kind of minor Lords that you owed your allegiance to. If you didn't have a Lord, you were lost. So one of the poems that he captures in his work is about this sparrow. This is an extended metaphor about life. 
the sparrow flying in at one door and immediately out another, whilst he is within, is safe from the wintry tempest, so that after a short space of fair weather, he immediately vanishes out of your sight, passing from winter to winter again. So this life of man appears for a little while, but what is to follow or went, went, went before, we know nothing at all. So these are our human lives, which are brief. We find warmth and family in the mead hall, and then we disappear again out into the dark. So if you ever wonder what earlier people were thinking about, they were having similar thoughts to we were. What is life? Why is it so brief? Where do we go after we die? These questions we've struggled with since the dawn of English and much before. All right, which brings us to the next major work of Anglo-Saxon history, which is a little hit literal history book called the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It records the history of the Anglo-Saxons. Um, all the surviving versions we have are copies of the original, the oldest one was written in 891 CE, but some copies went on recording history until the 1100s. So this is a super rich mine for understanding what was going on at the time. It is the only text we have that describes the history of England from the Romans to the Norman conquest, which we will also talk about. Norman conquest is really important. Just to give you an idea of the kind of things that were in there, um, this is the third paragraph. So they're almost the very beginning from the original. Here were dreadful forewarnings come over the land of Northumbria and woefully terrified the people. So these are bad omens, something that they were very concerned with. There were amazing sheets of lightning and whirlwinds and fiery dragons were seen flying in the sky. Kind of hard to know if that was metaphorical or not, or if they really thought they saw dragons. I'll leave it to you to decide. A great famine soon followed these signs and shortly after in the same year on the sixth day, before the Ides of January, the woeful inroads of heathen men destroyed God's church in Lindisfarne, island by a fierce robbery and slaughter, and the sick have died on the eighth day before the calends of March. So why did I pick this paragraph? It's talking about Viking raids. So now these Germanic tribes have settled, they live there, and now they're getting raided by Vikings. It's a little bit of a quick karma there. But the way that they're talking about specifically is against the monastery in Lindisfarne, which may be important if any of you have ever heard of the Book of Kells, which is a beautiful illustrated book um, that you can still see at Trinity College. Lindisfarne was a monastery famous for their illuminated manuscripts. So being attacked by Vikings was no joke. That was where the history of the country was living. So some of you may have heard of Beowulf. It is the most famous thing written in Old English. Um, it was written sometime between the 8th and the early, early 11th century. We don't know who wrote it. We have one manuscript. It's in three different dialects of Old English. Excuse me. The poem uses 36 different words for hero, 20 for man, 12 for battle, 11 for ship. So why do I bring that up? English has an enormous vocabulary. And as early as the 8th and 11th centuries, we had all these words already, a huge, huge variety, which allowed for amazing poetry. Now, Old English poetry doesn't rhyme um, the way we're used to thinking about it. They follow a strict alliteration. So the first syllable will sound the same for at least three or four words in a row. Um, there's a lot of rules to it, but that's the most essential. Um, the story of Beowulf takes place in the sixth century, so about 200 years before it was written down, after the Anglo-Saxons had already migrated to England, but were still closely tied to those Germanic roots. They hadn't become separated as they would be over time. Um, it's, they don't think that there was any religious significance to it. They think it was written purely for entertainment to be read aloud in a mead hall um, to those who were there. It takes place in a meat hall. Uh, the main characters, like um, the king and the hero, were most likely based on King Herogef and the Skildings um, in, from the 16th century Scandinavian area. The plot's relatively simple. The meat hall is troubled by a terrible monster named Grendel, so they hire a hero named Beowulf to come and take care of Grendel. Beowulf kills Grendel. Grendel's mother, the monster has a mom, she's extremely upset and Beowulf kills her too. 
for a really long time, um, people who studied the language and were interested in Old English really didn't think much of the poem. They thought it was a place for them to gather language and go from there. Um, they really just kind of used it as a mine. But along came an entrepreneur and literary figure you may know as J.R.R. Tolkien. Those of you who don't know, Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings, which had a cultural moment again about 10 years ago. But in the 30s, J.R.R. Tolkien revisited Beowulf and he said, there's a lot to be learned about culture here. Um, and the poem was started to be looked at in an entirely new light. So if you're curious what an old Ang English manuscript would have looked like, you'll see there a picture of the text with the uh, transliteration next to it. Um, an interesting note is that all Old English poems, for the most part, start with poet, and we have no idea why. <laughs> it could be so, it's just kind of this placeholder word that essentially is kind of like the beginning of a fairy tale. It lets the audience know we're getting started. So some poets will put it as so or listen. It's just kind of a pay attention, poem starting. So a whole lot. So I do want to play you a piece. I promise I won't go on for very long with it. I just want to play you a small piece of the opening lines of Beowulf in Quat we gar dena in yar dagum feud kuninga thrim ye frunan, hutha athalingus elen fremidon. Oft shield shaving, shad in a threatum, monigum maig thum meru settler oftia, egg so de erolas, sooth an arist worth, fashaft funden. Hethas frovra ye bad. We ox under woknum, we earth mundum tha, or that him I gwilch that a um sitendra over. So, as you can see, it doesn't sound a lot like modern English. When people talk about Shakespeare and call him modern, uh, call him old English, I always laugh because old English doesn't sound anything like English. It's quite far away. Now, you may be able to find some root words. Um, if you look at the fourth line from the bottom, you get that funky looking thorn, ayat. That word is fiat or that. Quis was good. Good. Um, so what he just read was, lo the spear dames glory through splendid achievements, the folk king's former fame we have heard of, how princes, de princes displayed then their prowess in battle. Uh, so we have a question here. I'm unaware of any language that combines two words into one with an apostrophe to shorten it. When did this start and why? I'm going to save that one, Michelle. I'm going to answer it later. I'm not going to mark it as complete because it does come up. Um, and if I forget, just remind me, but I'll keep it there. So essentially what we're seeing here is the beginning of storytelling in English. Um, and obviously what you heard wasn't super clear. So I want to play for you actually another video, and I hope you'll forgive me. Um, this one is a modern poet, Seamus Haney. He's an Irish poet. He's won quite a few awards for his poetry. He took on the big challenge of retranslating Beowulf, and I think he did a beautiful job that really captures the tone. So I'm just going to play you a little bit of that. <laughs> So, the Spear Danes in days gone by, and the kings who rule them had courage and greatness. We have heard of those princes' heroic campaigns. There was Shield Sheafson, scourge of many tribes, a wrecker of mead benches, rampaging among foes. This terror of the hall troops had come far. A foundling to start with, he would flourish later on as his powers waxed and his worth was proved. In the end, each clan on the outlying coasts beyond the Whale Road had to yield to him and begin to pay tribute. That was one good king. So Beowulf is there. That's what the beginning is talking about, is Beowulf becoming quite famous. 
Um, I like Seamus Haney's translation. If you're all interested in the sound of Old English and its translations, um, it's really worth listening to the audiobook version. He reads it himself and it's, it's quite beautiful. So we do have some other famous Old English poems. I'm just gonna talk about them very briefly. The Wanderer is a poem about somebody who does not have a mead hall. He is torn loose, his Lord is dead, um, and he is bemoaning his state as well as lecturing a younger man about some things that he could consider. The seafarer is similar. The wife's lament is interesting. Um, she's a woman who's lost her man. And I say woman because we translate it to the wife's lament, but the word wifa just meant woman. It doesn't mean wife until another couple hundred years. So we don't know if she was married. We don't really know much about the state of marriage at the time, if it was even important to them. Um, but she is kind of living through that moment of loss. And Dream of the Rude, um, which is taught in most classes about Old English, is particularly interesting. It's a religious poem. It's about the crucifixion. But Rude was the actual crucifix. And it is the crucifix life story about how it came to be a tree to be the cross that Jesus was hung upon. So it's a very interesting um, bit of a take on that, on that. So here we are, I promised you we'd get to the Norman Conquest. It took me almost 40 minutes, but here we are, we're at the Norman Conquest, um, which is important for a lot of reasons in English history, but it does have an enormous impact on English as a language because in 1026, William the Conqueror invades the island of Britain from his home base in northern France. Now, if you know anything about English and French history, they don't get along very well. We have a lot of wars, and this was a biggie. He, he won pretty handily, um, and he took all the property of Anglo-Saxon earls uh, and gave it to his people, to the Normans, and some of the English who supported him. The invaders spoke a dialect of rural French um, that had a lot of Germanic influences. France and Germany shared a border, and oftentimes language and culture spilled pretty heavily between them. If you go to out modern Alsace and Lorraine, the French they speak is, is heavily German influenced to this day. Um, old English became something that was only spoken by the lower classes, the peasantry, the people who were left behind to work the farms who hadn't gone to war. Um, but slowly, 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 the languages started to mix. All right, so we get this Norman French influence. French scribes changed the common Old English letter pattern from hua to hua to match their own dialect for consistency with ch and the. So where becomes where, huin becomes when, huil becomes while. So they, they start to re-standardize how these words are written out. There is no standardized spelling at this point. We will get to that. There's no standardized spelling. They're just in their own French transcriptions swapping those letters. So during the Norman years, English was the third language after French and Latin. French is spoken by the nobles and Latin is spoken by the Christian clergy. Um, and so English as a result started to simplify. It was only being spoken by a small group of people. They wanted to be able to communicate with each other and they started to get rid of a lot of the complications, which is one of the reasons English doesn't have gendered nouns like French or Spanish does. But then a curious thing happens. The Normans become English because despite English going underground and 85% of the original vocabulary of English being lost, it did eventually prevail. So in 1204, and if any of you like Robin Hood, you may have heard this story, King John, who is completely inept, loses the French part of Normandy. Oh, I'm sorry, Jill says, do you can explain again why English doesn't have gender nouns? We don't have gender nouns because it was just the peasantry speaking English. And um, a lot of the time when you get things like gendered nouns or fancy complications to language, it's something that you had to have time to think about and to teach, right? You have to sit down and teach people how to conjugate verbs and that kind of thing. And the peasantry were given a lot of time to do that. They were busy. So they started to simplify the language on their own. 
um, and they streamlined it. And one of the things they did was get rid of gendered nouns. It probably isn't something that they decided one day. It was probably just something that as time went on, didn't serve them a purpose. So they just jettisoned it. There was no gentry watching over it. When you have a language like French, the gentry and the peasantry were speaking the same language and the gentry had time to teach their kids in very fancy tutored ways and they would want to keep the language elevated. Um, well, an example of a gendered noun, it, every, all French nouns and all Spanish nouns are gendered, meaning it's la table, not le table, because a table is always feminine. Don't ask me why. <laughs> I, I took French for eight years and I can't explain it. But um, when I say nouns, I don't mean like you and me, obviously those gendered words exist in English, uh, but things like a mug would be female or male and you would have to use the appropriate modifiers. Does that make sense? Okay. So where were we? Oh yes. So if you remember your, uh, your Robin Hood we, in 1204, King John, totally inept, he loses part of France, of Normandy to the King of France. Norman lords suddenly had to actually pay attention to all these English properties. So what they would do previously, they wouldn't even live in England, these Norman lords. They would live in Normandy and they would have um, a man that they would send to watch over their territory in England. And that was a guy who usually speak both languages, um, but was probably native to England. Uh, all of a sudden, they lose all this property and they're like, oh no, we have to actually go live there and keep an eye on it. Then you get the Hundred Year War against France in which this loss was included. Um, and it made French the language of the enemy in England. It wasn't cool to speak French anymore because the French were the bad guys. And probably most importantly, we get the Black Death. Now, this might hit a little close to home right now, but the Black Death was um, inconceivably horrible. Uh, probably about 4 million people died. We don't have exact statistics, but we know it was about a third of the English population. And a lot of the people who died were the clergy who were speaking Latin because the clergy would go to minister to the sick and we didn't have a germ theory of disease. So they didn't know it was making people sick. They assumed it was a miasma, which was a bad smell. If you've ever seen those creepy uh, plague doctor hoods with the long pointed nose, the reason they had those is they had stuffed the nose with herbs because they thought if they couldn't smell the bad smell, they wouldn't get sick. Um, and priests probably did something similar. They probably held a bag of sweet smelling um, flowers or herbs to their nose. They would minister to the ill and they themselves would die, which is horrible on its own. But what the effect this had was that the Latin speaking population diminished incredibly. Um, and after the plague, labor was in shortage. A lot of the peasantry had died. And now this English speaking laboring class was enormously important and they had a lot of leverage. They essentially could do the medieval version of unionizing. They didn't have to work for peanuts because where else were you going to find somebody willing to do what they were doing? A lot of them were gone. Um, and that meant that we get the birth of a middle class because people, labor was valued, merchants rose in prominence. Um, and within a period of a decade, the linguistic division between the nobility and the commoner died. If you wanted to talk to a merchant, you had to talk to them in English. So we get the birth of Middle English. That's right, we've made it. <laughs> we are at Middle English. Um, so this is the English, oops, I'm going to pause. Is there any questions about Old English before I move on to Middle English? Or take my sip of water if anyone's frantically typing. Okay. So the English that emerges from this language merger solidifies in the 13th and 14th century, which means you wind up with something that sounds a lot more like English that we can understand. I love this excerpt. It's from a 14th century travel log. So see if you can understand it as I read it aloud. In that land, ben trees that barren wool, as though it were a ship, whereof men make in clothes and all things that may be made of wool. That doesn't sound too far off, right? So in that land, there were trees that bared wool as though it was of sheep, where men make clothes and all things that may be made of wool. Pretty close to understandable. 
So this is a huge leap from Old English, which bears almost no resemblance, to Middle, Middle English, which if you spend a minute or two, you can kind of get the gist of. And the man of the hour with Middle English, our great remaining writer of the time, is Geoffrey Chaucer. Chaucer is a fascinating individual, and I have a whole separate lecture on him that I give if you're interested, um, because he's actually extremely well documented. We know a lot about his life. We're at the time now where um, regular everyday documents have survived, things like um, accounting books and, you know, votes in um, Congress or Parliament, rather. So we have a lot of evidence about his life. He had a patron named uh, John of Gaunt, who was the Duke of Lancaster. He was one of the sons of the king in power at the time. And Chaucer wrote in English, most likely because he wanted his works to be accessible. It was the language of the land, even though a lot of the gentry did still, still, still speak French at court. Most people spoke English as well. And he would have written them with the intent that they would be read out loud. There's a lot of a debate about what the literacy rate was at this time. You'll hear numbers as low as 2%, some as high as 50%. Um, but a lot, it depended on where you were and who you were talking to. Even if 50% of the country was literate, there was no television, there was no radio. So transcripts like Chaucer's would be passed around and read out loud for amusement in taverns. And that's basically what he wrote for. There we go. Okay, the list of words first found in Chaucer's work there's tons and tons of them. Now, that doesn't mean he coined these terms. They're just the first time you find them. But you can see the list is long, so I'll read you just a few. Absent, digestion, latitude, outrageous, observe, perpendicular, princess, resolve. These are all the first time that these words have been written down. 20 to 25% of his vocabulary was French words, but the new words were likely these everyday English words. Chaucer's most famous work is the Canterbury Tales. Um, it's considered to be the first great work in English as we now understand it. And it was super popular at its time, which is so helpful because that means 90 copies from the 1400s still exist today. Um, brief overview, it follows a group of pilgrims, including Chaucer himself. That was a typical um, narrative trick at the time. The author would be with this group of people. So he had a reason why he was writing this all down. Um, and basically the host at an inn challenges these folks who are on their way um, to Thomas Beckett's shrine at uh, Canterbury to tell them two stories on the way out and two stories on the way back. And whoever tells the best, best story, he'll give them a free dinner. But what this allowed Chaucer to do was tell a story from a huge cross section of the population. You get things from a knight and a prioress a carpenter, a cook, a much married wife of Bath, um, to a body miller. For some reason, millers at the time were considered to be very shysty. It's not really clear why, <laughs> but millers were a profession that was uh, questionable. It also had a, um, a partner um, who was someone that could sell holy relics to churches, but were often known to be con men themselves because they would sell fake relics. You have to remember too at this time, just as a cultural note, we don't yet have the splintering of the church. The church is one monolithic organization through most of Europe. Now we get to, oh, then we have the general prologue. So I'm gonna play you just a little bit of Chaucer because I want you to hear our language shift that we've gotten from Old English to Middle English. Juan de April with his shore sorta. The draught of March hath pierced to the road, and bathed every vine in sweet liqueur, of wit vertu engendered is the flour. One severs egg with his sweet breath, in spirit hath in every hot and head the tender croppies, and the young son hath in the ram his half cos irona. And smaller fallers marking melody that sleepen out the nicht with open ear. So pricketh him nature in her courages than longing folk to go on, on pilgrimages. And Thomas for the second strunge strundis to fena howes cooth in. 
So that gives you the general idea of how it would have sounded. And you can see we're getting closer and closer to modern English. And basically translated those first few lines are, when April with its sweet smelling flowers has pierced the drought of March to the root and bathed every vein of the plants in such liquid by which power the flower is created. When the west wind also with its sweet breath in every wooden field has breathed life into the tender new leaves and the young sun has run its course as half an Aries and small fowls make melodies, those that sleep all night with open eyes, so nature incites in them in their hearts, so folk long to go on pilgrimages. So basically what they're saying um, is that it's spring, so people want to go on trips. And the only way to go on trips at the time, and, and you know, they didn't have vacations, you went on a religious pilgrimage. So it's nice out, let's hit the road. Oh, Michelle has a piece of information for us. The Miller issue, it was because they took commission off of what they milled for the farmers. The issue was related to the weight and proofing of weights to be true. Hence the start of scale inspections to ensure accurate weights. Yes, absolutely, Michelle, you're totally right. And on top of that, it's something Chaucer would have been very familiar with because one of his jobs was customs. So he worked at the customs issue and he would have been weighing a lot of the stuff that was being imported. And certainly that would have um, been familiar to him. Thank you, Michelle. So that um, general prologue is very close to what we expect of English at this point, but it's not quite there, right? We're still kind of circling closer and closer. So of course, aside from Canterbury Tales, one of the great books, especially at the time, was the Bible, still one of the best-selling books of all time. In 1384, John Wycliffe produced his translation of the Bible into vernacular English. So at this point, it had only ever been in Latin and that was extremely intentional. Only um, the, the clergy and very educated noblemen were able to speak Latin. It was a mark of distinction. So imagine if you will, at the time, peasants would go to church, they were pretty much required to, and they probably wanted to, it was some Sunday entertainment, um, it was their day off. And they would be read to out of this book that they were supposed to be obedient to, and it was a language they couldn't understand. And that was deliberate. Um, there was not a big interest in educating uh, the masses in, in, in um, their own tongue. They were spoken to in Latin. So John Wycliffe, goes out on a limb and he publishes the Bible in vernacular English. Um, it was immediately banned by the church, but people did circulate it kind of under the table. So we do have surviving copies of it. Um, there are over a thousand English words that were first recorded in them. And this is when we start to see Latin loan words come into English at last. So the Romans couldn't do it, but John Wycliffe's Bible did. And we get things like barbarian, birthday, canopy, childbearing, communication, cradle, crime, dishonor, envy, godly, all of these words start to enter into English. And now at last, English starts to sound like what we know of English. And it's all because of the great vowel shift. There's a huge change in pronunciation from Chaucer's time to the 17th century. Um, long vowel sounds began, began to be made higher and further forward in the mouth. So in Chaucer's time, long vowels were generally pronounced like very much like the Latin derived Romance languages. Sheep would have been pronounced shop, me, may, mine, mean, shire as sheer, mate as mat, out as oot, house as hoose, flower as floor, boot, boat as boat, mode as mood. So I'm going to play you um, a little bit of the before and after from a great vowel shift text. Someone who can really get the sound right. Out of your sleep arise and walk, for God man keened no hath it hack. All of a maid without any mark, of all women she beareth the bell no well. And thorough a maid, fire and wees, no man is mad of fo So that's pre vowel shift. Heaven wend, no heaven and earth to him thy bend. He 
and this is post Balshef. A that was foe knew is our friend. This is no nigh that he you tell Noel. So what happened? There's a lot of debate as to what happened with the great vowel shift, and it was probably a number of factors. Um, there's no consensus among scholars about any one of them, but some things have come up um, talking about the rapid migration of people after the Black Death, which caused accents that were forced to change to a standardized London vernacular. Um, Jill, I'm not gonna replay the whole thing right now, but um, I will also provide the, the playlist that I used today at the end. So if you wanna go back and listen yourself, it is like a four minute long video. So I just, um, just wanna keep the flow going, but I'm happy to send that to you afterwards. Um, again, it's gonna be things like, I think sheep and shop are one of the best examples. Um, so others are saying that the in, other scholars think that the influx of French loan words as the languages merged might have caused it. Um, you also get this thing where the aristocracy just want to sound different from the peasants, so they may have kept using the French pronunciation of letters despite speaking in English, um, which is a process called hypercorrection. But really, ultimately, people just don't know. Um, it's just one of these things that happened over a long period of time. Um, and changed how he pronounced virtually everything. Which brings us to the English Renaissance. So starting in the 16th um, and going through the 17th century, it's known as the Elizabethan era or the era of Shakespeare. And what I always love is when people say, oh, I don't like Shakespeare. That's an old English and I can't understand it. Well, now you've all heard Old English and you definitely can't understand it, but that's not what Shakespeare's written in. Shakespeare's modern English. He's just early modern English. Um, during this time, Latin was being deliberately brought into the language. Now it's coming in full bear. Um, okay, Jill, Jill is saying um, back to the vowel shift, I'm sorry. But now that we have words both mood and mode, so did those two words exist back? They didn't. Um, mode is a modern word. It's just the pronunciation of mood was moda. That's the vowel shift. Okay. Um, sorry, so um, speaking of, right. So Latin starts to be deliberately brought into the language. And a lot of that is because of early science. So you'll see that the words that I have there, species, specimen, apparatus, you have the beginning of the Renaissance of science. People are starting to do experiments. We don't understand a lot yet, but we do need words to explain them. And they also used words to fill in um, adjectives where for existing Germanic nouns. So you have the noun see, but you would describe something as marine. You have the word walk, so you would describe someone who was walking as a pedestrian, that's Latin. Um, or maybe you might have an additional synonym. Um, again, a lot of the times Latin was used to prove you were educated. So instead of saying manly, you would say masculine because that made you sound more educated. So Latin starts to merge into English. Um, 17th century also really liked, um, 17th century classical language is also influenced by the spelling of Latin words, which changes how people pronounce them. Because if you only know a word from reading it, you're going to pronounce it differently. Um, so debt and doubt have a silent B added to them. So when we start talking about, um, you know, Michelle was asking about why is English so hard to spell? because people wanted to sound fancy in Latin. So they started adding Latin spelling to words that had never been spelled in Latin before. Um, so there you go. They were going back to those Latin roots of dubedum and duberter, where the B was being pronounced, but they just wanted to be fancy. So they stuck the B back into the word and don't pronounce it. If you asked a child to spell doubt or debt, I don't think they would put a silent B in them. Um, but it was during this time that English was finally elevated out of being a low vernacular entirely. It was the language of the land. It was what everyone spoke. England was English. And another important thing comes along. A little guy known as the printing press comes in 1450. It arrives in England in 1476. And the first book printed in English was The Recule of the Histories of Troy. Recule is a word we no longer use, but it means it's a compilation. 
at the time of the introduction of the press to England, um, there were so many dialects of England and some words had up to 30 spellings. Um, the Chancery of Westminster, they tried to make an effort um, starting in the 1430s to set standard spellings for official documents. And this is what sets the stage for standard English. So here's another reason why English spelling is a mess. We had multiple dialects, multiple words that meant multiple things, and um, there was no standardized spelling of them for a long time. So the consequences of the printing press are many and varied across the land, but we're just concerned with the language. So the, for a long time, had been spelled with the rune, the thorn rune that we talked about earlier, the. But printers went with the because there was no runic characters available for the presses. Presses were created in other countries who did not use these runes. But some people didn't want to give up the thorn. They liked it. So instead they used a Y which led to ye, which is why you may see when you go to the Renaissance Fair, ye old shoppy, because ye meant the, um, and it stayed ye for a really long time. Francis is asking, why did the printing press take so long to get to England? They were really expensive to make and they didn't catch on right away. Um, remember, you have a low literacy rate. The idea of owning a book was really actually quite an expensive process. So it took a entrepreneur who had the foresight that this thing could really take off to purchase one of the machines and start making use of it. Um, printing takes a while to get off the ground. Like a lot of new innovations, people didn't think they had the need for it. Previous to this, if you wanted to get a book, um, it was very difficult to own them. They were usually written by monks, they were copied, um, or maybe they were copied by scholars as time went on and, and the church lost control over that. Um, and they were all handwritten. They were very expensive as well. So printing um, only takes off when the machines start to pay for themselves and it's cheaper to print than it is to literally write out the books. So you have this issue with um, ye, <laughs> ye old. Um, and then you have the letters U and V, which in Middle English were interchangeable because they look the same, right? U, V. So if you were writing them out, it really didn't matter which one you wrote. Um, and they were generally just both used as a U sound, um, but one becomes a vowel and a consonant because of the printing press, you can make it clear U, V, you can sharpen that bottom up. Um, one of the big reasons why they were interchangeable is just like we were talking about with the runes where you wanna go straight up and down. When you're writing with a quill, writing anything with a curve can break the quill tip. So V was used for both U and V. Um, S as well was very difficult. So often if you're reading Middle English, S is written as kind of a funky F, which also impacted how words were pronounced. Um, the same thing happens with I and J. Again, J, if you do the dip at the bottom of the J, your quill point's gonna break. And that's annoying. So everything was I, but then you get the printing press and now we can write a J and the J gets its own unique sound. Um, Particularly difficult with spelling was names. Again, a lot of people weren't literate and even people who were, um, were just going off how it sounded, kind of the way kids now would write. Um, so we have more than 80 different spellings of Shakespeare's name, including in his six known signatures, he spelled his name three different ways, including one in his own will was spelled differently. So if you can't remember how to sell, uh, spell Shakespeare, don't worry, you're in good company. He couldn't either. So let's talk about Shakespeare. He's kind of a big deal when it comes to English. Um, he coined about 2000 new words. And unlike Chaucer, we know that he coined them because there's a lot of other existing um, manuscripts and stuff that exists from that time. So we know these are words that are only found in Shakespeare. So he probably did make them up. Um, I won't bore you with a full list, but you can see there are some examples there and there are things we use all the time. My favorite is homicide, because that's one he would have modified from Latin. Uh, brittle, radiance, many, many, many words. He used over 34,000 unique words in his work, which means he had an enormous vocabulary for the time. And he also introduced a lot of phrases that we still use every day, like one fell swoop, vanish into thin air, brave new world. You can buy posters, I own one, of all of these phrases that Shakespeare coined. So he gives a tremendous amount of weight to the English language. And don't forget, more Bible. 
So poor Thomas Wycliffe, his Bible was banned. He was chastised for it and it went under the table. But in 1611, King James finally commissions a translation of the English Bible. Um, it had the royal stamp of approval. It was put together by people from the church, scholars as well. There was 54 people involved in the writing of it, at least, that we know of. But one of the things they did when they translated it, if you've ever read the King James Bible, and it's likely if you've ever picked up a Bible in, in America, it's probably the King James Bible. It's still considered one of the standard Bibles of the, of the time. Um, it may feel a little archaic. It may be, well, it was written in 1611. Of course, the English is a little bit old. Well, guess what? It was old for the time. They wanted to give the text weight. And just like now, when we hear things that are written in older language and they sound heavier and more important, they thought the same thing back then. So the English um, that they used for the King James Bible was kind of outdated even at the time. So just as a quick comparison, we have Wycliffe's Bible in 1384. And Jesus sang up to the popple, went oop, and you see there, there's the V in up. Oop into an hill, and when he was set, his disciples came into him. There is a version of the Bible that was written in English between Wycliffe and King James. It was by Tyndale um, that we have a surviving copy of. I believe his was also banished by the church. When he saw the people, he went oop into the mountain, and when he was set, the disciples came to him. So that's actually pretty simple language structure, and that's in 1526. The King James version and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came on to him. So you can see there is a purpose escalation of the language. So when it comes to standardized spelling, one of the best ways to do that is with the dictionary. So the first published English dictionary was a table alphabetical. It was published by English school teacher Robert Caudry in 1604. Um, but it wasn't a very reliable dictionary. It wasn't complete. Any dictionary written by one person is a bit of an uphill battle. Um, in 1755, Samuel Johnson wrote what's considered to be the first kind of vaguely reliable English dictionary. It's called the Dictionary of the English Language. Um, and it was 43,000 words, and it was considered the best English dictionary until about 150 years later, when we get some a little something called the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, which is still considered the standard, gold standard for dictionaries. Along with um, spelling, we care a lot about grammar. Um, Robert Loth wrote the first grammar book in 1762. There's Murray's Grammar in 1794. And those two books really start to bring together what we think of as modern grammar. So when people say grammar rules have been around forever, well, they've been around until since about 1762. Um, and these correct grammar rules came from two or three people. Uh, so Loeth is the one who establishes that a double negative always makes a positive, never end a sentence with a preposition, and never to split an infinitive. So remember, English has been around since roughly, in a form that we can sort of understand since 1000 AD, um, and we get a standardized grammar in 1794. So if that's any indicator of how much grammar means, I leave it up to you to decide. Between 1750 and 1800, after these come out, 200 works of grammar and rhetoric are published. And then in the 1800s, we get at least 800 grammars. So people became very obsessed with grammar and mostly that came from standardized printing. Don't be intimidated by the slide. I, pro I promise I'm not trying to overwhelm you. But what happens through the 16th and 17th century is Brit Britain, strong now Britain, very English, monolithic country, um, they have an enormous naval power and they start to go everywhere. And the thing about English is wherever it goes, it takes stuff. <laughs> um, in, in this case, it takes words. So this, is, this list is kind of overwhelming and it's not complete, but everywhere we go, we consume words into our language. Now, some of them we know when we say them that they're not words that we consider English words but they're pronounced in an English style and we've been saying them for so long that they get folded into our vocabulary. One of my favorites on this list is the German Kindergarten, kindergarten which means child's garden. Um, Germany invented the idea of a year of play before formal schooling. And it was mostly took place outside in a garden. 
which I think is really lovely. Um, but you'll see there's Arabic words there, including algebra. Of course, um, the Arab people were really ahead on math for quite a long time. So a lot of our math words come from them. Um, tycoon is a Japanese word meaning rich person. Um, bamboo, which is a word we kind of know is in English, but you know we talk about bamboo very casually. Uh, Polynesian taboo um, and tattoo. So we start borrowing all these words and wrapping them up into English, which is another reason why our spelling is so complicated because these words aren't ours, they're transliterated from other cultures. We get another huge language push with the industrial and scientific revolution. Um, this is the main distinction, distinction between Shakespeare's English and our English. Grammar and spelling have stayed the same, but it's a leap forward in the industries and sciences that means we just need a huge amount of new words to describe what the heck we're doing. Um, the British Empire at this point is enormous. English has become the dominant language in many parts of the world. And the USA is now growing and changing English as well. And we're innovating a tremendous amount. So we need all these new words to describe things. Train, reservoir, combustion, piston, hydraulic. And we take old words and we give them new meanings. We reinvent things like apparatus and pump and locomotive and factory. These words existed pre-industrial and scientific revolution, but they're rebranded and brought into this new time. Um, and then sometimes to make words make sense, we just combine stuff together. This is a very Germanic language thing. Excuse me, you may have seen towards the beginning with Old English, this word kept coming up, Middle Earth or Mid Garden. Middle Earth means the world that we live in. It's between heaven and hell. So we're in the middle, Mid Garden. Well, English, modern English does this too. It's how we get railway and horsepower and typewriter and cityscape and airplane. These are two existing words that we've smushed together to make a new meaning. Which brings us to American English. Um, we are, we don't speak the mother tongue the same way that the English speak it, right? Um, so some English pronunciations and usages froze when they came to America, but they continued to evolve over in Britain. So in some ways, American English is closer to the English of Shakespeare than modern British English. And I have such a cool video to show you about accents and how that's true in, with the Southern accent in America. This one's short, so I am gonna play it in full for you. But the primary reason, uh, most people don't realize that the American Southern accent is not a sign of ignorance, but actually the fact that, according to linguists, we're the only people left in the United States who generally still sound like our ancestors. Because if you listen to native-born Southern speakers, the average Southerner tends to sound more like this, what we call this Moonlight Magnolia Draw, because if you speed up that Southern draw, over time it rapidly becomes a British accent. Most people don't realize that people that came here from Europe were largely from the United Kingdom. So when they got here, this was more along the lines of their speaking tones. But that's the first and second generations coming off the boats, not their children. By the third and fourth generations, the kids don't quite sound like mom and dad anymore because they're starting to develop a slight elongation of the way they talk. What's today called the Virginia Tidewater accent? It's not a complete southern drawl because that's a port area. But as you go farther into the southern interior and the years progress, the accent tends to get thicker, deeper, richer by Arkansas, Alabama, Georgia. Heck yeah, you got a full-blown Southern drawl. But people don't realize that in most cases in Louisiana, many of the native speakers don't sound like that. They tend to sound like this, I guarantee. Spell it around the bayou. Because you speed up that South Louisiana Cajun Creole accent, over time it becomes en français, French. With, of course, certain exceptions in New Orleans, which tend to sound like more like New Yorkers because of the Irish and the Sicilian Italian influence. So they tend to sound a bit more like this. And people tend to get a little confused because they think, what, you're from New York? No, nah, I'm from New Orleans. Why? So you have to realize that at the end of the day, Southern speakers, like I said, we're not ignorant as it's often been assumed, but we simply sound like the ancestors that came here so many years ago. One of the reasons I happen to really love that video, and I'm glad Michelle, you enjoyed it too, is not just the example of what they're giving, 
but what she's talking about in general, which is the assumption of ignorance based on the way people sound. What we, oh, Francis is asking you the reason for the elongation, probably a lot of different factors, um, but I think part of it is the culture in general because of the heat tends to move a little slower, so people start to speak a little slower. But we make a lot of assumptions based on how people sound, and that's not just us, it's all around the world. Remember I was talking about all the way back to those old English kingdoms of Sussex and Wessex. You know in England that if you have a Liverpoolian accent like the Beatles did, you sound quite different from the London accent, which is very posh. And there's class assigned to those accents and that happens in America as well. So part of that frozen British English is a lot of the words that we use that the British don't, it's because they continued to evolve their language and we kept some of the old words. It's not that we chose new words, they did, believe it or not. So we still say fall where they say autumn, we say trash, they say rubbish, we say hog or pig, they say mostly pig, we say sick, they say ill. My favorite is they still call math, maths it's mathematics, I suppose, uh, loan and lend, things of that nature. Um, part of this is also the Puritans, were very conservative in their language, and that extended to not absorbing Native American languages pretty much at all. We have a few words, they're mostly um, relating again to plants and animals that probably some pilgrims said, what's that? Um, and the Native American person told them. So some of it, but they've been changed pretty substantially. So the word squash is derived from the word for squash, but that word was asquatch, squash. Um, raccoon was probably from rogracon or ragacon, um, and hickory for hickory trees was from paukachihikora. So it was kind of a bastardization um, that the settlers put onto a Native American word. So when America was being settled in 1619, we had roughly 20 slave, African-American enslaved people. Um, by the time of the Civil War, there's over 4 million enslaved people in America. The, these captured people had to create what's called a pigeon to communicate with their captors. A pigeon is a grammatically simplified means of communication that develops between two or more groups that speak different languages. So it's kind of an attempt to bridge the gap of communication. And these enslaved people were obviously highly incentivized to um, find a way to communicate with these people. But the longer they spent in America, this pigeon becomes what's known as a Creole. And a Creole is a stable, natural language that develops from simplifying and mixing two different languages fairly suddenly at a point in time. Um, to give you a different example, Yiddish can be considered a Creole. Um, what's interesting about the Creole that develops, and this is a Creole that's just called Creole generally, um, by, it's the, one of the first ones that was identified by linguists, so it's just kind of called Creole on its own. Um, but it also influenced how the white slavers spoke as well, because they still had to communicate with their slaves. So I'm going to show you another little video that I happen to love. Um, and this is a woman who, she's doing a historical reenactment, but she's speaking in one of the Creole languages that still survives to this day, Gullah. The story is called Kumyang Binyan, and the story goes a little like this. It's like, mm -hmm. So as you can probably hear from that, it is a distinct language that doesn't sound like English, but is an amalgamation of an African language um, that was brought over with the slaves and mixed with English. I do have here a link to a list of uh, other Eng English involved Creoles. There are 
quite a few. Some of them are now um, extinct languages, unfortunately, but there have always been many. Current modern English, how I am talking to you right now and hopefully how you're understanding me. Um, modern English has a different problem when we're trying to teach it to speakers, which is it is a language that is extremely dependent on how we emphasize words. So I love this particular example. The sentence is, I never said she took my money. I never said she took my money. I never, I never said she took my money. 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 Seven different sentences in one. Very difficult to communicate and teach. With the current technological evolution that we're going through and the ease and speed of information, English continues to change every day. Radio, television, and telephones have introduced their fair share of new words and phrases into our lexicon over the last century. There's a whole new version of internet and text speak that has tons of abbreviations that we use out loud. LOL, OMG, um, things of that nature. We get all of these slang that's spread incredibly quickly. Slang used to be very regional and now it can be national really quickly. Selfie is a slang word. Like a boss, I can't even, all the feels. Um, English is just a difficult language to learn. We've combined many, many languages over time and it evolves very, very fast. It's also the most widespreadly used language in the world. Um, it's more widely spoken and written than almost any other language. There are, these numbers I think have changed since the last time I gave this talk, I think it's gotten higher, but there, there's about 7.5 million billion people in the world and 1.5 billion speak English. Um, but over 700 million of those people speak it as a second language. It's the language of trade. Only 360 million people speak English as their first language. It is the language that so many people have to learn if they wanna leave the country or even work in many industries within their own country. Um, and a lot of this is due, is due to English colonialism. England spread far and wide and they made their tongue the lingua franca, which I find to be such a ironic phrase because lingua franca referred to when French was the dominant language because of colonialism, um, but it is now English. Um, and that's led to language shifts and even language deaths. 54 languages have had their last speaker die in the past 20 years. English has won for better or for worse.